Hello, I'm Mishka, and uh, this channel is the Helsinki Renaissance, where we will be talking about arts and culture, and hopefully the most Renaissance man-like manner with arts and culture may be discussed, so uh, please stay tuned for that. Now, I uh, since I've been doing this um, Criterion catch-up uh, mini-series for this channel, I thought that just about the most obvious um, uh, title, or uh, the most obvious kind of a video, for a series like this would be something like my top 10 Criterion Collection releases. Now, um, unlike uh, some other YouTubers who have either Criterion exclusive channels or near uh, Criterion exclusive, uh, or shall we say at least uh, Criterion centric uh, channels, uh, I do not have um, vast collections of these what for me are import uh, DVD or Blu-ray items. Uh, so, unfortunately, when I'm doing this list, uh, I, I don't have uh, all of the titles with me. Uh, of the uh, 10 films that are listed for my uh, 10 personal favorite releases by the Criterion Collection uh, in the DVD and Blu-ray lineup, um, I only have three of them with me right now, but I have owned eight of the ten that I listed and uh, two that I um, two that I uh, have never owned. Uh, the title number nine and title number five on the list. Uh, I do have plans of getting uh, very soon and. Uh, I'll, you know, when we get to those uh, title number nine and title number five, I'll explain why it is that uh, I am very grateful for the Criterion release, even though I haven't yet bought them, even though there's been ample opportunities, but I've just always uh, uh, passed by them. But uh, anyway, as I said in my uh, video called uh, Introduction to Autobiographical Significance, uh, I had a fairly large DVD and Blu, well, not Blu-ray, just DVD collection when I was younger, but uh, I did unfortunately get rid of most of it, and along that, uh, some uh, Criterion titles that later went out of print went along with them, and it is what it is. But uh, anyway, um, I... Uh, I I just want to say that I do have uh, familiarity with these particular releases, even though I don't have all of them with me for this particular video. Uh, now, anyway, as for the kind of personal criteria for this uh, list, it's this is by no means what I think are the 10 best movies in the Criterion Collection. So uh, the quality of film does matter, but also, I feel like the quality of the release matters. So, in other words, is it a very basic uh, release with, you know, ma mainly just the movie uh, and sometimes even not uh, a brand new uh, restored version? But, uh, you know, is it just the movie or are there lots of extras? Uh, and then, kind of the cultural impact of the release and then the kind of rarity of the movie, they all play kind of a part uh, in that uh, I, uh, you know, when uh, some people want Citizen Kane released by Criterion Collection, the reason why that wouldn't be any kind of particular dream choice for me is because there's no rarity aspect uh, to Citizen Game being released because there are plenty of special editions available of that movie. Not saying that I wouldn't want Citizen Game in the Criterion Collection because I like all of the Awesome Wells titles. It's just that it's not the top priority because of the lack of rarity. So the criteria for this list is the quality of the film, the quality of the release, uh, the rarity of the release and then the kind of cultural impact. So I'm just sort of taking all of those into consideration. But anyway, with that introduction out of the way, let's go to the uh, number 10 selection, which uh, for me is uh, Federico Fellini's Amarcord. Uh, 
Uh, I had the title uh, as a teenager. Uh, I can't entirely. I mean, it had to have been one of the first uh, criterions that I got. And uh, um, the reason why, I mean, I, I suppose I can't in fine explain why Criterion's Amarcord release is first my favorite Fellini uh, release that Criterion has, uh, and uh, why it is my favorite uh, Italian film that Criterion has released. I mean, you know, for me, uh, I mainly like the black and white period Fellini, so I I do tend to favor the, the early Fellini, uh, and as such, uh, you know, I don't want to sound like a character out of Woody Allen's Annie Hall when they are discussing tendencies in late period Fellini, but I, I just feel like um, there is that kind of a sweet spot there in that kind of, like, uh, late early period Fellini almost, like uh, those kinds of releases from, let's say, the white shake to eight and a half or something. I feel like Fellini, he has his kind of, uh, uh, like, aspects of slight fantasia in sort of a vaguely realistic decor. And that I think that Fellini was, uh, the films were very nicely balanced then. Uh, and then uh, it's just um, it's just to me slightly fell apart when he just uh, uh, well uh, became kind of a you know excess all areas uh, director. So um, it, it's not necessarily coming naturally for me to um, focus on a lot of. Fellini's late period works, unfortunately. So uh, I almost start tuning out after the eight and a half releases. But there's two major exceptions. Uh, the first one is Amarcord, and the second one is And the Sheep Sale Zone, which I think are both very successful movies and both are released by the Criterion Collection. But uh, anyway, I can't entirely explain why it is that uh, Amarcord, and in, in particular that version of Amarcord, just um, feels somehow special to me. Like the Nino Rota music, this kind of a, um, uh, this kind of a dream of a lost world uh, aspect that uh, movies can sometimes represent. I think it's all coming together very nicely uh, in just that particular movie. Uh, and uh, I, I do think that the Criterion release is uh, kind of an optimal uh, presentation of it. I think that, uh, if I remember correctly, that title perhaps has gone out of print, uh, but, uh, you know, obviously it would be uh, brilliant if uh, there would be, uh, you know, if, if only uh, <laughs> Criterion could... Uh, have a Region B Blu-ray release, uh, that would uh, certainly be a movie that I'd get back, but maybe it will happen, maybe it won't happen, but uh, anyway, uh, I, I do think a lot of the uh, Criterion Amarcord. Now, uh, the ninth selection that I had is one that uh, I've never had this uh, box set of uh, Ingmar Bergman's Fanny and Alexander, and uh, perhaps somebody thinks that it's not necessarily the best form to uh, select a title that you haven't had. But uh, the thing about why it is that I think that uh, Criterion's Fanny and Alexander is a special release is because um, uh, somebody may or may not know that uh, the uh, title is divided uh, between... Uh, uh, the theatrical version and the television miniseries version. And then uh, I think that uh, there's some sort of an Ingmar Bergman makes a movie documentary uh, alongside it, which uh, for some is significant. Now I haven't, I haven't personally seen it, so I can't talk about that. But uh, I just do appreciate uh, the fact that uh, both of the versions of Fanny and Alexander uh, are made available. So... Uh, I, uh, 
it is one of those things that I do appreciate about uh, Criterion Collection. In that, uh, um, I, I've never personally actually seen the, the TV miniseries version, so all my life I've only watched the theatrical cut. Uh, now, I, I think that the, uh, the theatrical cut is uh, a contender, I feel like, for Ingmar uh, Bergman's best movie, if I'll use the American uh, pronunciation. Uh, there's a couple of other contenders. Uh, sometimes I go back and forth with a couple of his 50s titles and then Fanny and Alexander. But, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, well, since I uh, consider it, uh, some days I consider it Barryman's best movie, uh, I obviously also consider it uh, Criterion's best uh, Ingmar Bergman release. Uh, now, uh, you know, I, I wonder if the scenes of a marriage uh, release also had some sort of a different... I think that there's different cuts of it uh, as well. Now, uh, if there are, I can't remember entirely, but uh, I, I think I've seen both versions of that, so... Uh, that doesn't necessarily seem that significant to me. And also, I don't know that I consider it that, uh, you know, absolutely a top tier uh, Bergman work, although I do consider it good as such. But uh, anyway, Fanny and Alexander, I feel like it's a release that's on a completely different level. And uh, it's among those reasons why uh, I think that uh, it's uh, worthwhile to care about the Criterion Collection, so that's why it's number nine. And uh, I do plan on getting it, uh, basically, the first chance that I uh, I have. Uh, now, I don't remember whether it's in print or not, but I'll, I'll get it as used. But, uh, you know, it's just, uh, uh, it's just, I have a, you know, uh, interest in, uh, checking the uh, TV miniseries version, although I don't think that I'll prefer that uh, cut of it, but I'll just watch it uh, regardless, you know, one of these days. Uh, now, the, the eighth uh, selection for this list I actually do have with me here. Um, it's the Mr. Arcadin box set. Uh, from Criterion, uh, this is by number 322, so uh, this is, uh, um, you know, has been out there for uh, quite a while. Uh, I can't remember whether it's in print or out of print, but uh, anyway, um, this I feel like is one of the forgotten Orson Welles movies, and uh, obviously, or well, if you know anything about this release, then the main selling point here is that this has three different versions of the movie. Um, there's the so-called Corinth version, which I believe is the theatrical release version, uh, or at least I think the Corinth version is referred to as the kind of version that... Uh, uh, Wells was preparing, like, uh, there's a lot of extras that go into the kind of uh, difficulties upon release, but, like, the Corinth version is something that was kind of like a prepared release version. I think the confidential report version, if I remember correctly, was a truncated version with some material cut, and then the comprehensive version is uh, something that uh, carries more more material than those two. Uh, now I'm I'm not an expert in the uh, you know differences in the versions, but uh, I just I do greatly like that Criterion offers the chance of watching. Now I I've only watched the Corinth version myself, so I I haven't tried the other two. Um, but uh, but anyway, like uh, it is. For me, uh, you know, uh, very much appreciated and special that Criterion has offered the opportunity to contrast the different uh, versions uh, between Mr. Arcadian. Now, uh, 
it's a uh, it was a mildly notorious uh, uh, moment when uh, Cahiers du Cinema I think uh, selected Mr. Arcade as one of the ten best movies of all time in some of their polls or uh, well, there, there was something like that. I don't think that highly of the movie. Uh, I think that, that the plot is kind of negligible, but there is such a, there's such a funky baroque uh, atmosphere and kind of architecture to uh, the movie in that, that there is definitely a lot to like it. I don't think it's absolutely top tier wells in that his, the highest heights of his, uh, you know, director career obviously are better than Mr. Arkadin, but I think it's definitely an underrated hidden gem, and as such, uh, I am uh, very happy that a company like Criterion is uh, putting out a good version of it. Uh, now, uh, happily, I have the seventh... Uh, selection as well with me right now and uh, it is the Michael well I should <laughs> I perhaps should refer to this as the Alexander Korda version of the Thief of Baghdad now this was a movie that has I think around three or four credited directors and who knows what else went on with the kind of production, but uh, Michael Powell is the most high-profile director uh, credited here, but uh, it's left a bit uh, ambiguous to me as to uh, what kind of percentages uh, which director uh, did. Uh, now, uh, some viewers may or may not know that this is a remake of... Uh, was it a Douglas Fairbanks movie from The Silent Era? Uh, I can't remember right now. Uh, I don't have a very good familiarity uh, with the original. Was it Raoul Walsh directed, if I don't remember uh, completely incorrectly? But anyway, I don't have a very good uh, memory with whatever that was. But uh, this this release, to me, is kind of a, an underrated achievement from the Criterion Collection. Uh, in the sense that uh, uh, I, I, I think that Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger, they are very well regarded directors in general, but I feel like there's a certain kind of a flatness to how the archers are appreciated, in the sense that uh, I think uh, a couple of titles like uh, Red Shoes uh, and perhaps... A Matter of Life and Death or Colonel, uh, Life and Death of Colonel Blimp or Black Narcissus. Like a couple of the titles sort of monopolized the conversation around Paul and Pressburger. Whereas I think that even, even fairly negligible Michael Powell works do have a certain kind of a charm to them that uh, should receive, uh, higher interest from film buffs and uh, I, I don't know whether it's uh, whether I'm sort of uh, reading the temperature of the room wrong or not but I've gotten the sense that uh, the Thief of Baghdad isn't considered a high profile uh, release in the Michael Powell filmography and that uh, people don't think that this is as big a deal as Red Shoes or Black Nut Scissors or something, but uh, I would put this in the very top tier. I, I Like some people might dislike me saying this, but I, I think this is... I think this is the best movie that Michael Powell has been associated with. I, I think that this is even better than uh, Black Nut Scissors and Red Shoes. Now, I, I realize that that's potentially controversial, but like that's just one part of it. Like I, I, I absolutely uh, love uh, the Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Scorsese commentary track on it. I, I think that it has such a warm, you know, glow to it, and uh, the other extras are good as well. But like highlighting uh, 
a, a marginally less uh, well-regarded Michael Powell work from the past. Uh, I think I think there is something important for it. Uh, you know, some other uh, slightly more obscure uh, Powell releases, like uh, I don't know, uh, the small uh, the small back room is that the title uh, or uh, a Canterbury Tale. Those could also be sort of contenders. Uh, I know where I'm going as well. I think is kind of a little gem that uh, perhaps should be a bit more remarked. But uh, you know, there could be more than one uh, Michael Powell and or Emerick Pressburger movie um, in this list. But uh, my personal favorite is is this one. Uh, Partly because of the movie, partly because of some of the extras, but uh, I just uh, um, I am happy that it's getting some type of love somewhere because I just feel like uh, it is getting a bit lost in the flood in some of the a bit more high profile uh, Paul and Pressburger releases. Now at the sixth. Uh, selection for this list I unfortunately don't have with me right now. I used to have it. It's uh, Yasuchiro Osu's Tokyo Story. And uh, I had the, uh, I had the, you know, Noriko's Tier uh, DVD cover, not the newer one with uh, the old couple uh, sitting, uh, sitting of that re-release cover. But uh, well, I mean, uh, the the cover, <laughs> the cover art either way isn't really uh, swinging the selection uh, either way. But um, you know, uh, there's plenty of other Yasujiro also releases that could have made this list. In that, I think that uh, uh, Criterion has several uh, absolutely home run uh, also releases. But uh, Tokyo Story to me, it just seems like there's something just a bit more to it. It's it's kind of difficult to explain. Like obviously, the film is one of the most well-regarded masterpieces in the history of cinema, and the Criterion release is very, uh, you know, a very nice release. Um, I I forgot to say in my Finnish cinema video that Aki, there's an Aki Kaurismäki interview in the. Ozu extras. There's, there's something like five tributes to Ozu with, uh, uh, I think, Hoshia Shian, was it Paul Schrader, Claire Denis, uh, Aki Karusmäki, and uh, I think I'm forgetting one. But, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, the the extras are nice and everything, but I think that Tokyo Story to me is kind of like a, a good standard bearer for a, a kind of an average uh, special release from the Criterion Collection. In that it sort of does everything that you want a Criterion title to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is one of those um, Criterion films that uh, I do miss that uh, I used to have. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly plan on uh, getting again whilst, uh, you know, after I uh, sort of rethought this idea of uh, whether to have a, uh, some sort of a film collection or not. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think Tokyo Story uh, from the Criterion Collection it is one of their essential releases and uh, I think uh, would make lots of other folks' top 10 as well. Now, uh, I'll say that in passing because I think that these other ones that I selected, Thief of Baghdad, Mr. Arcade, Infanne and Alexander and Amarcord, I don't know that they would necessarily make a lot of Fox's top 10 because with over a thousand releases uh, that are there sort of floating in the Criterion collection, obviously there's lots of great releases and uh, conceivably, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it's, it gets crowded fast when you consider the good releases, but this is just my personal uh, favorite. Uh, but uh, yeah, Tokyo Story probably a more uh, popular choice for this one. Now the, the fifth one that I had, uh, that, I, uh, that I chose is an, 
the one other movie from this list that I've never had uh, of the... I, I've never personally had uh, the Criterion release. And I'll explain why why I chose it regardless. Uh, it's a Terry Gilliam movie called Brazil. Now, obviously, anyone whose memory stretches back to the laser disc era, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the Criterion uh, version of Brazil for uh, some older crowd uh, perhaps was one of the more legendary uh, works in that uh, it sort of started... Um, like, Brazil was a landmark release because it showed a side into how it is that the, the home video experience could offer something that the cinema-going experience couldn't. So basically this documentary about the Battle of Brazil contrasting the, uh, the Love Conquers All studio-mandated cut versus Gilliam's uh, harsher uh, version and so on. Like uh, this entire box set uh, presentation that could show uh, what, what the kind of secret life of a movie production is, how it is that, you know, Fritz Lang, for instance, said, uh, uh, I think it was in the Jean-Luc Godard interview called Dinosaur and the Baby, that uh, the studios took the movie from him in post-production and cut the scenes that were the only reason why Lang even wanted to do the production in the first place. They just cut it magnificent Amberson style and threw away the deleted scenes and, and so on. And there's nothing Lang could do uh, about it. So, you know, there is that kind of secret history of cinema of how a lot of classic movies could have been different without some type of studio meddling and so on. And uh, the Criterion release of Brazil sort of started opening the door to this kind of idea of... Uh, how it is that these movies, uh, there's this kind of messiness in how that sausage is made, and uh, perhaps sometimes people want want to see it, perhaps sometimes people don't want to see it, but uh, uh, certainly, you know, if there are any, if there's any, like, a cultural impact to Criterion Collection releases, then certainly the Brazil uh, box set would be... Uh, kind of a consensus choice for that. Now, uh, again, I've never bought the DVD box set uh, of Brazil, but I do plan on buying it. I don't know whether it's in print or not, but uh, again, uh, I I think I can get it uh, pretty soon if I'll just uh, choose. Uh, choose to do so. Uh, Brazil isn't necessarily my favorite Terry Gilliam movie, or, well, it it is not, and it isn't even necessarily my favorite Terry Gilliam Criterion release. However, I just think that there is something special about it that sort of uh, necessitates choosing it for uh, for this list. Uh, now, uh, the fourth selection is another title that I think unfortunately may have have passed into out-of-print status. Uh, and it was one of my favorite uh, criterions that I used to have. Uh, a GW Pabs movie called Pandora's Box. Uh, now, again, like with Amarcord, it's kind of difficult to explain why it is that uh, I just thought that uh, there was something so special about Criterion's Pandora's Box in that uh, there are other releases of it, I just think that the Criterion release is so good that it makes all of the other ones look pretty pale in comparison. And uh, the Criterion releases, why some collectors of physical media or something, why they think that Criterion has some sort of a king uh, like uh, position on the field is because they do have plenty of those types of releases that if you've... Uh, uh, got then uh, some sort of a sense of how, how this that criterion does release as well uh, than uh, some of those other 
But the releases look uh, quite not so great. And uh, uh, Pandora's Box, I think it's genuinely a contender for the greatest silent film of all time. I'm not saying that it's necessarily my number one choice or necessarily even my, my like runner-up choice, but like it is a genuine contender. It is a top-tier movie. I think uh, the best uh, pubst movie. Uh, actually, uh, my uh, runner-up contender for the second best pubst movie uh, it is uh, something that I wish Criterion would release since uh, they had that uh, Western Front cam uh, camera shaft uh, uh, those releases recently. If Criterion could release the uh, Paracelsus movie that Pops did, uh, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. But uh, Pandora's Box, I think Pops. Uh, best movie and uh you know one of the best movies of all time as well uh and uh it has a very rich presentation in the criterion box which is why i chose it as the as my fourth favorite uh criterion release uh, i think that that could conceivably like brazil and tokyo story probably would be the two main consensus choice uh consensus choice selections from my list. I think that Pandora's box uh, probably would would also be sort of closer to them in that I think that others also regard that as somehow particularly special uh, for for the Criterion collection. But but anyway, uh, the, the third choice for my list probably uh, would be the most eyebrow raising out of all of these. Uh, but uh, uh, there is this kind of a slight autobiographical reason why I think that uh, the Julian Duvivier movie, Panique, uh, is somehow... Uh, uh, this is one of the uh, Criterion releases that I'm most grateful of. And uh, the reason why is that uh, I did a video for this channel a long time ago where I uh, criticized the programming tendencies of the National uh, Cinematheque here in Helsinki, and uh, they had a Julien Duvivier themed series, and, uh, you know, I, I basically don't regret anything that I've uh, said uh, for basically any of the film-related videos that I've done on this channel, and that uh, I, I think uh, I represent my, you know, film-related opinions in a pretty uh, even manner, and there's no reason to regret them. However, my my sort of casual dismissal of uh, highlighting Julian Duvivier's work, it is just about that one only regret that I have uh, for an earlier video, in that uh, I just um, I, I I should have I should have seen greater value in uh, highlighting Duvivier's filmography, and uh, you know to be fair for me, um, a lot of the Duvivier's that I had had seen, uh, they it's not that they aren't high profile work. I just think that uh, they are. Like, I have seen plenty of famous Duvivier works that don't necessarily showcase absolutely the best side of his filmography. And uh, unfortunately, I hadn't seen movies like Panique, which I, in all likelihood, even if I had seen every Duvivier movie, I probably thought that this was his very best. And it is uh, something that I'd call the kind of masterpiece that I think more people should see. And uh, obviously, you know, it's uh, Criterion doing a great job trying to bring more audiences to a movie like this. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that in many ways this does showcase sort of the best of the old school. The way that uh, some movie like uh, uh, the Claude uh, Sauté, uh, Class 2 Risk, I think that that's also one of the kind of um, slightly less heralded, uh, you know, pitch-perfect masterpieces of French cinema. 
to me, class two risk, for instance, I put it, I think it's even better than Jules Dassin's Rififi. I think it's even better than Jean-Pierre Melville's uh, classic crime films in that uh, uh, Criterion has also released Class 2 Risk, uh, which uh, I, I think is great of them, but uh, I, I think that Panique is more uh, commendable as a release still. Now, uh, 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 I, I can't remember, what, was it Claude uh, Lelouch, who, uh, uh, I think he has a movie called Monsieur Iré, uh, which I don't know whether it's, I, I've never seen it, uh, so I don't know whether it's a remake of this or whether it's based on the same uh, Simenon uh, source material or what's going on, but like obviously it might have been marginally interesting to be able to contrast both this and Monsieur Yoré uh, in the same uh, collection if possible, but uh, uh, I don't think this downright needs it, I just think that that was like a bit of extra that Criterion perhaps left on the table, uh, but uh, but anyway, this might be an obscure choice, but uh, I think it is Criterion at the top of the game. This is a sensational release, and uh, if folks haven't maybe considered this movie, they, they definitely should. This is, uh, you know, for anyone who likes uh, Henri Georges Clouseau or vintage Alfred Hitchcock, you know, this is uh, in that ballpark. It's it's a great release, and uh, I think, uh, you know, showcasing the best of Criterion collection. Now, uh, the second release, um, I, uh, I bought it on Region 1 DVD, but because there's a Region B Blu-ray, I need to, you know, upgrade it. So I don't have it presently, but it was one of the... Like, it's almost, like, I'd almost want to go so far as to say that the greatest single release that Criterion has ever done would be my number two choice for the list of uh, Edward Young's A Brighter Summer's Day. I mean, the, like, I'm, I'm obviously kind of a young person, but I'm still old enough to remember uh, uh, this kind of a slightly dodgy blue uh, bootleg <laughs> era where, uh, you know, trying to watch some uh, some of these hyper-obscure Asian movies that, uh, you know, something like Wong kar Ashes of Time before his Redux cut. Like, trying to trying to get some, some type of cop copy of Ashes of Time or... Uh, you know, hearing these stories about uh, Ho Chi uh, City of Sadness or uh, Edward Young's A Brighter Summer's Day, like as some sort of towering masterpieces, uh, you know, it's just not not getting to see them. But then, you know, it's it's not just a get of criterion allowing you to see it, but allowing you to see it under the very best kind of conditions in that, uh, uh, you know, it's it's difficult to get more pristine than what the Criterion A Brighter Summer's Day is. And, you know, the movie, uh, the, the extras to it, like, uh, it is just about the best that Criterion ever has done in my eyes. And uh, obviously everything around that A Brighter Summer's Day release, it just couldn't be a bigger deal. So uh, I considered putting it number one, but I didn't. Uh, now, uh, I think that my number one choice is, like, almost cheating, and uh, I tried to avoid doing this, uh, because uh, uh, these, uh, um, these are all single film releases, but my number one choice is a box set, uh, but uh, I, I just couldn't think of putting anything other than this at number one. Uh, and it is the, unfortunately, out of print uh, Hiroshi Teshigahara box set from the Criterion Collection that I felt like I had to put it number one. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, 
Uh, I had seen uh, Pitfall and Woman in the Dunes available from Eureka Video and British Film Institute respectively. Uh, I, I can't remember whether I had seen uh, The Face of Another, uh, but uh, but anyway, there were other releases of these movies available as well. But uh, again, I, I just, um, I mean, this is going to sound strange, but uh, the reason why I feel like I need to put uh, the Teshigahara, you know, uh, Kobo Abe trilogy or whatever it's even called. Uh, the reason why I felt like I had to put it number one is because, kind of strangely, I feel like the Criterion release in and of itself is kind of an attraction that's best displayed in just how, in very slight ways, the Criterion release is obviously, to me, a bigger deal than even fairly well-respected uh, alternative releases from, say, Masters of Cinema, BFI. Uh, I, I just, I can't really explain it. It just felt like such an event, you know, when I had that Teshigahara box set. In that, uh, it just, uh, it just felt like there was such a slightly more vibrant level to the kind of film culture that uh, it displayed. And uh, I just, I can't think of what else, you know, if, if it's not Brazil by Terry Gilliam, what else could get the top spot? And uh, just for me personally, uh, the, uh, the Teshigara box set uh, is, um, uh, is where it's at uh, with the Criterion uh, collection. Uh, you know, I, I was happy to see some of the slightly more obscure short films by Teshigahara in the supplements. There were some, uh, some nice interviews, uh, the James Quant um, essays and so on. But uh, it's, it's mainly just uh, this kind of, um, uh, this kind of, uh, I, I think that uh, how I'd phrase it is that I think the Teshigahara box set by the Criterion Collection, I think that what it reached was this quality of the optimal presentation of the movie. Now, obviously, some film buffs would rather have Blu-rays than DVDs and so on. But, like, uh, as far as uh, the, uh, you know, abilities that a DVD box set can have, I think that Criterion displayed how it is that, that they can uh, release these movies in the most optimal form with the kind of... Uh, 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 with the Teshigahara box set. Now Criterion also has a couple of other Teshigahara releases, but uh, I would go, like, I would make so bold as to say that uh, um, I, I just, I would really appreciate it if Criterion released everything that Teshigahara had done. Like, uh, I, I have seen them, since I already mentioned some, you know, um, uh, some old bootleg stuff like uh, uh, the the other uh, Kobo Abe film. The what is it called in English? Is it is it called a ruined map or city without a map or something like that? Uh, you know, I don't think it's great. I don't think it's anywhere on the level of that uh, uh, that box set. But, uh, you know, shabby as it is, kind of a also run title as it is, I would appreciate it that, uh, what is it called? Something like Dear Summer Sister or something like that. That so, Something to do with, is it American soldiers dodging the Vietnam War in Japan or something like that? Like that, I mean, the Rikyu movie, I mean, it's, it's not on the same level, but like uh, I, I just... Uh, you know, these, these aren't on anywhere near the same level of uh, Woman in the Dunes or the others, but like, uh, I just, I can't help leaving it unsaid that, uh, you know, uh, Criterion, whether it be on an Eclipse box set as kind of a more basic release or, or what it will, 
but uh, anyway, like uh, getting more Teshigahara in any way, shape or form to the Criterion Collection would be uh, would be greatly appreciated. But uh, let me stop myself since uh, we arrived at the end of this video. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just say that there were some other films that I considered for the list, but because I didn't want to do any cheating, I didn't want like uh, a top ten list should have ten movies, and the the number one Teshigahara box set it's kind of flirting with cheating in that uh, there's three movies and and so on, but uh, you know we we let it slide because it only happened once, <laughs> right? Uh, now, um, uh, you know, if if uh, folks would, uh, uh, if by my rules the boxes should have been rendered ineligible, uh, I guess I could have uh, I could have basically pushed from two to ten all of them up a spot and added something else at number ten. But uh, I just think that that uh, there was something. Something so deserving about the Teshigahara box set uh, that uh, I, I just felt like I, I had to do it there. But, you know, by that same rationale, I feel like uh, there's a bit more there in the Mr. Arcade and Fanny and Alexander box set as well. So, you know, it is what it is. But, um, but yeah, uh, I think that that was pretty much it for this video. And uh, if you like this video, I hope you'll consider watching... Uh, some of the earlier videos on this channel as well, because um, that's what they're there for, uh, waiting for uh, audiences to give them some sort of a chance. But uh, anyway, uh, that was it for this video. Uh, thank you for watching, and uh, bye bye for now.